And I am excited to welcome Ed Michael Reggie, the CEO of Funeralocity, uh, to the stage to uh, lead us in a discussion on something that is oftentimes very confusing. Uh, and it's, it's one of those, there's a lot of topics that we talk about, Ed Michael, that uh, we hear the phrase regularly, uh, I'm not ready for that yet. Oh, I don't want to think about that yet. And let me tell you, when it comes to funeral planning, that's one of those things that most of us, it's, it's very difficult to even think about it because it's like, oh, if I think or plan for this, then it's going to come true. And as we all know, it's going to come true to all of us. It's one thing that is definite in this world. We're all going to pass away at some point. So figuring out how we're going to get our affairs in order and, and manage that is very important. Um, so Ed Michael, I'm really excited to have you here today. Before we dive into uh, to the discussion and learn about Funeralocity and the COVID-19 program that's out there, tell us a little bit about your background and what led to you founding this unique company. Uh, Steve, it's great to be with you. Um, I'm from New Orleans originally. Um, I went to Tulane, I'm an MBA from Tulane, but I've spent my career really in healthcare. And it was great to see all the people chatting here who are in various forms of healthcare here because I consider myself a healthcare person. The last two startups I did were in clinical drug trials. Uh, I've been um, CEO of a hospital chain in the South when it went into bankruptcy. I've uh, had a faculty appointment at Tulane University Medical School. So I really regard myself as a healthcare person, but something that has just been eating away at me for years and it kind of started for me when my dad died as well, um, is the continuum of care that we're all taught about really has one more step. And it's death care, as they call it, it's funeral service. And I was amazed as I've gotten closer to the business, how opaque it is, how um, prices are unknown, and people traditionally go to their family funeral home uh, just out of habit. And it's an amazing thing because it's the fifth most expensive expenditure generally for an American is the funeral. Hmm. Um, it's auto, car, house, wedding, and funeral. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we just walk right into it and more than 90% of the 19,000 funeral homes in America don't put their prices, their general price lists online. And they know that people traditionally just call the family funeral home. And those prices keep tripping, keep, you know, keep getting higher and higher and higher. And uh, I just thought we needed to do something about it. So we've gone, we went out and put the prices of every funeral home in America on our website. We're the only place that has that. Uh, ratings, reviews, I'm not rebelling against the industry, but I think we need to turn the headlights on and let people, excuse me for saying it, shop for a funeral. Uh, we live in the age of Amazon and I believe that people need to see that. So I've done this as a consumer advocacy effort. Um, I want people to see, uh, it's an amazing thing to, to look at too, because you'll look in, a, in your traditional American city, you could buy a, a direct cremation for six, $700 or five or $6,000. The, the variation in, in cost is stunning. And of course, we all know that we don't always want the cheapest of anything. We don't want the cheapest car, the cheapest house, but um, we need to look at those prices and figuring out the right decisions. So I love it. Uh, man, th th this is great. And, and it, it's, it, I, I started my guide to senior living options 32 years ago with the same thing. I was blown away that there was no directory of senior living communities. So where do you go? It's the one that you drive by on your way to work. And it's the, I, I, I know it's the same thing in the funeral business. It's uh, wherever, whatever you drive by, wherever your aunt uh, had her services, and it minimizes the opportunity for a family 
to to make a choice and feel good about that choice. Yes, um, and the, and the, and the age of the internet has given us comparison websites. We have many of them that we look at. Expedia, TripAdvisor, mm -hmm. OpenTable. There are many places where we can look at our alternatives and analyze them in one place rather than go from Marriott's website to Sheraton's website, yep. to Hilton's website, and then, oh, let's change the dates. Oh, let's go all the way back and start it all over again. So I believe that a comparison website is one of the wonders of the internet and it should be in senior living. It should be in virtually all of the especially ex expensive decisions we have to make. Yeah, and uh, so folks, I dropped in the Funeralocity link to the website into chat and um, so you can check that out. But um, all right, well, uh, I think you've got some great resources to share with us here today, Ed Michael. Um, I think you you prepared a PowerPoint to keep you on track. So if uh, if you want to share that, that would be great. And then I want to remind the audience: at any point in time, you can ask questions or make comments. Just use that Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on chat in case somebody drops a question in there. And uh, and then Ed Michael, I'll just uh, I'll kind of hang out here on the on the screen with you and I'll make sure to let you know if there's any questions related to anything that you're saying. Very good. Is my screen up? It, absolutely. Um, some of this I've already spoken about. Um, mm -hmm. Funerals being the fifth most expensive item we typically buy, more than 90% of the 19,000 funeral homes don't post their general price list. 83% of the time, that statistic comes from the industry itself, from the NFDA, the National Funeral Directors, 83% of the time, consumers call only one funeral home. And funeral homes know that. Um, so we went out and collected the price list of all the funeral homes and, uh, and, and post them in apple to apple comparisons as a, hopefully, an aid for families analyzing. And you know, we also live in a mobile society uh, where many people live where they didn't grow up and they don't know who the funeral providers are. Uh, and so I think it can help them as well. And Funeralocity.com is a free consumer service. Um, uh, let, let me, you may be bringing this up in on your next slide, but the, uh, can you give any sort of thoughts on the pre-planning of funerals? I know that that's something that I see a lot of where the, the concept of, hey, I'm gonna pay in advance or what have you, um, any, any thoughts on that? Yes, um, I don't have a slide about that. So let's talk about that. Uh, Pre-planning, it's, it's such a funny word, isn't it? it? We just skip the word death in there. <laughs> it's a pre-death planning. Um, but pre-planning is done about 30% of the time. 70% uh, of the time, families have to call and, and grieving family members have to speak with a funeral home and plan mom or dad's funeral, not in the best condition. And I think by every measure, planning a funeral in advance saves a family money because typically the person who is going to be buried is the one planning his or her funeral. And they're gonna do what they want and they're gonna pay for it as a gift to their family typically. And um, you won't have someone saying, well, shouldn't we get that gold casket for mom? Isn't that the way to honor her? And all of those crazy decisions that we make in a grief stricken state. So without a doubt, as we say, shop before you drop. Uh, people should uh, plan their funerals, fund them early, even if the family's involved in that, but um, there's too much panic and last minute uh, chaos at the time of, uh, of someone's death, as well as the grief stricken state of everyone. It's not the right time to make an expensive purchase decision or to plan an event of any type. Yeah, this is great. And you know, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna share my screen real quick because while you were talking, I just pulled up your website and I'm in Reston, Virginia, and I did a search. And uh, as you can see here, the um, it, it gives me a map 
you, you know, where I can see the locations of all the different uh, funeral homes. And then you can scroll down here and see all of your different options. And, and then this is pretty cool. You've got the average pricing in my area here. So I can go out and have a conversation with these providers and, and with some context of pricing. So I'm not potentially being taken advantage of, not that, that we're saying that anybody's gonna do that, but it's, that's why Consumers Reports Magazine is so helpful is because before you buy that washer or dryer, you know generally what the price should be. Um, so, uh, so that's great. And it really, I'm glad we're bringing up the pre-planning because this sort of leads into the other thing that we talk about a lot on these discussions is you can figure out, you know, with your spouse where you want to be buried or cremated or how you want it to do. You can pay for it in advance, but the most important thing you got to tell your family and your loved ones what you what you are doing um, because Ed Michael I know there are a lot of families that have done all of this but they don't tell their kids and their kids are still scrambling around trying to figure it out um, at at the 11th hour absolutely there are um, you know you, you, FYI when you pre-plan you can't write a check by consumer law to a funeral home and there's a good reason for that. Um, if you write a check after you pre-plan your funeral and you die 20 years later, the funeral may not even be there and no one may remember it. And so consumer laws have been passed in every state that require that you purchase either an insurance policy, which is the case 70 plus percent of the time that names the funeral home as the beneficiary, et cetera, or you fund a trust, either one okay. of those and yes, Funeral, uh, funeral insurance companies have to, after a certain period of time, refund these amounts because families sometimes don't know about that mom and dad bought these policies. And then after a certain number of years, it's assumed that at age 101 or whatever, that person has, has, has died. And so by, by law, these funeral insurance companies have to come back and look for the families. And what a shame. Um, so very important, it needs to be in the, in the real important documents that a family has, right with the will and everything else. But people really need to look at that before the will. They need to know immediately the day of death that everything has already been planned and paid for. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really glad you clarified that. And again, I've never had this discussion on one of our, one of our talks here, but that always concerned me with when you would hear this pre-planning, and I knew that there was a pre-payment element to it, but in essence, what you're saying is the this is, you're buying an insurance policy, and in most cases, or you're setting up some form of trust. That, that gives me a lot more confidence, and it should give the audience a lot more confidence, too, in that there is some fiscal accountability here in, when anybody is prepaying for these types of services, that it's, this is regulated and there's actuarials and, and all that stuff that are involved. Absolutely. No fear that the funeral director is running to Las Vegas with the money or the company is going bankrupt or things happen in a 10 or 20 year cycle that are the natural course of business events. And you don't want you want to be insulated from that. And I think these laws are good for you. I, I love it. All so, right. Well, I, I hope you don't mind me derailing, but I wanted to give people a glimpse at, at how, how great that site is. Uh, and then uh, I think you're going to share some trends uh, with us. And then we're going to get into this COVID, um, uh, the, the COVID-19 program that FEMA has that can help assist people who passed, or who passed away due to COVID. Uh, with some assistance. So you can go back to sharing your screen, I think. At the bottom there. And, and just a reminder, folks, if there's any, uh, oh, while you're doing that, uh, let's see here. While, while you're doing that, uh, Rebecca Grayson says, Medicaid punishes you 
for having a funeral trust. You cannot have any resource over $2,000. So this might be a big problem for a lot of people. Do you have any other resources people can work around? Um, um, that's, that's not exactly accurate. Uh, if the trust is an irrevocable trust, it is absolutely excluded from the assets of the individual so that they can become Medicaid eligible. An okay. insurance policy also, both of those, there are variations on them to absolutely assist families in becoming Medicaid eligible. Okay, so great. There is a way to do this. Uh, oh, and Reggie, at the top of your screen, see where it says display settings? What is that? At the very, at the very top, there's like a drop down. It says display settings. Yeah, click on that. And it, it should give you an option to, so we don't see the notes. Uh, oh, just there. do duplicate slideshow, I think is what you. How's that? Uh, let's see. Oh, uh-oh, we stopped sharing. Um, and just go back, it's still visible to everyone. Just share it again. I'm sorry. Um, there we go. Perfect. Okay. That's all we needed to do. You know what this is equivalent to? It's banging the side of the TV set. <laughs> yes. All right. So you got some trends for us. Yes. Um, as many of us know, cremation is on the rise in a big way every year. It's projected that by 2030, more than 70% of all funerals will be involved cremation. Um, different reasons for that, um, but the trends are big. In California and Arizona, much higher percentages, and in the Deep South, much lower cremation percentages, but everyone is going more and more uh, towards cremation. And, and in COVID, there was a lot more cremation because you couldn't have a funeral, you couldn't do anything, so people cremated the remains and waited to have, as in many cases, second funerals where later in 2021, there would actually have an event in which they called that the funeral, but in the meantime, a direct cremation was the intermediate step. So cremation is growing. And, uh, and I wanted to just say, cremated remains, of course, there's some creativity here. They can be interred, of course, meaning they could be buried or placed in a mausoleum. They can be spread, of course, but there's also, you can make them into jewelry or paperweights. You can place them in coral reefs. People are even putting them in tattoos. Um, some of that may be a little mystifying, uh, but there's a, there's a little problem I wanted to alert everyone to, and that is, what's in that jar, Mom? <laughs> Millions of loved ones' urns are now being kept on mantles, under beds, in attics. Um, we need to recognize, in my opinion, that that's an intermediate disposition of mom or dad or your grandparents or whatever. It's not the permanent solution. And um, we all should think about uh, before you bring the urn home, uh, what's the long-term plan with it? Because eventually people forget what's in the urns and what are these things? And they keep getting you know, placed in attics. And anyway, it's an issue for us, I think, as we move forward and the cremation rate continues to increase. Uh, we should think about this. Uh, yeah, and Hollywood loves to... Uh to poke fun at this with the, you know, the Thanksgiving dinner where mom's ashes were spilled or the urn crashes or, or what have you, is, is that rec also recognizing that there, there are more secure ways to, like you said, I mean, you can make paperweights, but you can also have a urn-like device that is not going to potentially break or spread the ashes all over the house. Um, the um, yeah, I, I love that, and I I do I really do like me personally. While I I I recognize tradition is very important in all of our families and our lives, I think this is an area where I see people really putting some creative thought to how they want to be remembered and uh, making the celebration of their life a more positive experience by adding 
that twist to it. I mean, I think one of the one of the, the one of the things a great example of this is the the surfer's funeral, where you know the surfers go out in the water and form a big circle and spread the individual's ashes in the ocean. But I've but I've seen some much more creativity in the burials and in the memorials as well. Um, this is a big problem for the funeral industry because it's you know it's still 85% mom and pop operations who are just doing it the way granddad did or their dad did or whatever. They don't see themselves, in my opinion, as event planners, which is really how they need to see themselves. And they seem to think that the funeral parlor is where everything needs to take place. Look at, look at wedding planners. That's creativity. That's Absolutely. innovation. They should be thinking that way. And families are certainly boomers and others. We're all thinking, well, you know, I want to have a, and the new word is, the new term is celebration of life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that's what people want, a celebration of life. And many times those are taking place outside of the funeral home. They take place in a hotel or in a, in a facility, in a restaurant. They're taking place in other places. And as you said, very creatively, uh, out on the water, uh, on a sailboat, in all kinds of different venues. So um, the industry has got some catching up to do, I think. Yeah. And, and uh, Mamela has a question, but I see it's your next point on the, 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 uh, on the slide here is, what is a green funeral? Wow, what a great question, because I put it in quotes there. Um, is a cremation a green funeral? I mean, it, it, it's the equivalent of uh, driving an automobile 500 miles to cremate a body. Um, but of course, burying people involving especially embalming fluids. There are millions of gallons of embalming fluids poured into the earth every year. Is that a green funeral? Um, so things, it's being talked about a lot more than it's being acted upon, but green funerals there is in the state of Oregon and, and another state is about to uh, actually legalize human composting, which actually creates almost just an earth that is then deposited into forests for a truly green result. And there's also a simple box burial without embalming, which is another way of doing it. But of course, many people are concerned about what's happening with cemeteries taking up so much space and so much green space. So there are pluses and minuses here. Um, there is something called water cremation, which sounds very nice which is uh, technically called alkaline hydrolysis, which is a form of water heated up with, with, uh, with lye. And, and that takes a few hours, but it is far less impactful to, to the environment in doing that. So people are trying to innovate, they're moving forward in certain directions, but overwhelmingly we're not green yet. Okay, but uh, yeah, I didn't, you know, I, I, I've seen some of these um, uh, uh, memorials sort of uh, where it's like a plant, almost like a planter and your, um, the ashes or the remains are somehow integrated in that. But I didn't really think about, you know, green could be the location and just minimizing the impact of guests having to drive or 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 what have you. So it's it it sounds like a, a real broad term that let's minimize the the impact. Yes. Um, just a little factoid here, and I don't want to be unpleasant, but we call them cremated remains ashes, and they're really not. They are 100 percent virtually Crunch, crushed bone. Okay. The body itself vaporizes during cremation. So when you think about bone fragments being deposited into the earth, I mean, it's going to be a very slow process of integrating back into the earth, but uh, it's not like cremated remains can fertilize a tree or anything like that. No. And uh, I guess yet nearly every other living uh thing on this earth is uh ultimately you know decomposing into the into the ground and, and what have you so uh um okay 
Somebody asks, uh, body composting, can you talk about the new funeral com concept for composting a person's body and remains? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, it's, it's a long, it's a, it's, a, it's a few weeks process in which uh, it's an expensive process today. And I wish I could point you to the one operation that's doing it so far. Her name is Katrina Spade, S-P-A-D-E, and I just don't remember the, na uh, the name of her company, but um, it's in Oregon, and it's a long process in which you are truly, the body is deposited and composted with other organic items, and it takes a while to go through that natural heat that develops, and it, the body breaks down. Eventually, though, the bones are just like cremation, having to be dealt with separately. You have to read an incredible okay. email. Okay, great. And actually, I found a TED Talk that- uh, Yeah, you did a TED Talk. That's yeah, right. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop that into chat for everybody to take a uh, gander at it. And um, uh, that's a great- um, She's the early- Player. Yeah. She's uh, very early in it. I, it's a bit expensive, um, uh, but it's a, you know, a great, interesting effort by her. Excellent. And then your last bullet here on trends, the rise of the nuns funerals are increasingly non-religious. Yes. So uh, funeral homes very often pr provide celebrants um, uh, because there is no religious affiliation. It's, as America becomes more and more secular, it's just an interesting thing that uh, many funeral homes were tied to certain religions. Uh, the Jewish faith still is pretty solidly has Jewish funeral homes, but the, the concept of a Catholic funeral home and a Baptist funeral home, those really don't exist very often anymore. And the, the aspect of a church being even part of the funeral is declining very rapidly. It ends up the whole event may be taking place at the funeral home, or there may simply be, as we've discussed here, a cremation with a celebration of life somewhere else. Um, no religion at all. Right. Uh, Kenneth uh, asks, uh, a person dies outside a hospital. The person is an organ donor i.e. their eyes or their kidneys. Can you discuss the normal process from death to cremation for an individual who is an organ donor? I've always been curious about that as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on that and I'm, I'm not gonna conjecture on that. Uh, we know that every, um, uh, when the fun funeral home gives a, puts a death certificate, I don't know what they're looking for in that regard. And, I don't believe, I think it has to take place before the funeral home uh, gets the body because okay. I think it's gonna be too late, but that's, it's a great question and I wish I could answer it. Okay, well, one of the best things about these discussions is nearly every time, uh, nearly every discussion we have, it leads to another thread. And uh, Kenneth, I'm really glad you asked that question and I will, see, and, and maybe Ed, Michael, the two of us can team up and see if we can have, find somebody who might talk at, at more length on the, the process of a, um, what happens between death and burial or death and cremation. That would be really interesting. It's a great um, question because so many people now die at home as opposed to in the hospital. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to explore those dynamics, Where's hospice's position here? And what, what is happening? Um, you know, are the right parties alerted at the, at the time of death? It's a, it's a great question. I think it's gonna remain more in the healthcare realm and probably not at all in the death care. If you can yeah, and, realm at all. And, and then um, somebody else uh, asks, uh, and this may tie in, but I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on this, is when we say that we're donating our body to science, like how does that impact a, a, a burial or cremation or a celebration? And yeah, when somebody says they're donating their body to science, um, it, are they truly donating their entire body or 
is it like like um we just said uh, kidneys or something like that um they're they're donating their entire bodies and there is typically a free burial or cremation that's a part of that a contract with that party that the body is donated to so it, it is actually in uh trying to manage one's penurious finances, many people will look to body donations to get a free funeral. Right. And they're, they're helping, you know, medical research as well. So it's, it's really a benefit. And, and that's, that's great to know um, yes. that there's that benefit there. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really eager to jump into the FEMA, but we got another question here. It says, without the use of of a funeral home, family can take care of their own dead and care for the body and bury. The book is Caring for Our Own Dead, Home Funerals. Can you talk about this? It's not against the law in Southern states not to use a funeral room, home, or even bury a body in the backyard on family land. Um, thank you that that was an anonymous person that asked that question. Thank you for bringing that up because I wanted to bring that up too. I, I had heard about this. Can, can you share any thoughts on this? Um, it's absolutely correct. In most states, you don't need a funeral home. Um, you, you need a death certificate and funeral homes are equipped to issue death certificates, which are necessary, of course, in, uh, uh, in, in, in disposing of an estate and, and doing a lot of business things at the end of someone's life. But no, in most states, one can have their own funeral. Of course, Burying in at your home is going to depend on local zoning, et cetera, and local regulations. But absolutely, that is correct. Um, and uh, thank you for the person that shared that. I found the book on Amazon. It's Caring for Your Own Dead. And um, I, I added the link to Amazon. And uh, I'm going to track down this author. I hope they're, they're out there because Lisa Carlson, because that would make an, a really interesting discussion on how that's done. Uh, I know that things like, you know, there's this assumption that you need formaldehyde and this, that, and the other, and there's ways to preserve a body in one's home and celebrate their life in the home, but, you, you know, doing it the right way and the proper way. And like you said, having all the, the proper licenses is very important. So th thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Important point. Uh, again, uh, Tim asked a question, and I, I, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this one, but what happens to metal parts like titanium hips at cremation? Um, they are removed um, and, and uh, dealt with. Also, pacemakers and other uh, uh, foreign objects are removed in the cremation process. Great. And um, and uh, I'm I'm throwing this into chat too. The book the book that we reference gives a step by step guide about how to get a death certificate, and the family can do it if they choose. Okay, well now, you know, unfortunately, death has been something that has been screened from all of our headlines for the last two years, thanks to COVID nineteen, and um, the. Uh, Ed Michael, until we chatted the other day in scheduling this event, I had no idea that FEMA had a program to uh, potentially cover some of the costs of funerals, burials, cremations. Um, can, would you like to share some of the details about that program? Yes. Um, for those who don't know, the American Rescue Plan Act, which was an add-on to the CARES Act, provides reimbursement to all American families for COVID-related deaths since January 20th of 2020, up to $9,000. That's every, we've had 747,000 COVID deaths. The federal government wants to pay for all of the funerals. It is, as was said at the time, a, a small way that our government wants to um, help those families who suffered. There's no means testing. There's, um, turn off that phone. Um, we, amazingly, 
Um, and to apply, one must call FEMA. FEMA will not call you. There's an 844 number that I have listed here. It's on the FEMA website and also on the funeralocity.com website. Um, it's a 20 minute phone call with a FEMA representative. Um, and they're gonna ask some questions. That's why I say here, do your homework first, meaning they want the social security number of the deceased. They want the social security number of the person applying for reimbursement. They will ask household income information only to gather that information, not to make a decision because it's, there are no needs tests. Um, and importantly, you can't apply online. And very importantly, you must make that call and start it happening. And then you will be given a link and two uploads must take place. One, the funeral home receipt. Notice I put receipts. There could be more than one if there was, as I've been to uh, a, 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 an early death in COVID, but the real event didn't take place for a year. Both events get receipts for both. They need to be under a licensed funeral home though. So that's the one restriction and the death certificate. Uh, must be presented. The death certificate must show that COVID was a contributing factor in the death. That differs, interestingly, from a lot of criteria of death certificates in different states. Some states want the dominant cause of death, not contributing. So people might have to get their, uh, the death certificates amended to, to, to get reimbursed. But $9,000, a very rich benefit, considering the average American burial costs only $7,700. This is a, an amazing uh, program, and it's amazing that so few Americans have applied for it. As you can see below, 40% of Americans have applied. Um, I don't know if it's they're not aware or they fear red tape. And I can tell you, we've been testing it. At the beginning, there were long holes to get on, to get a FEMA representative, that's not the case anymore. It's a 20 minute phone call in which they're gonna go take you through it and prove who you are and, and take you through that process and also express sympathy. Uh, but the red tape really, I have to hand the federal government here, they've done a pretty good job of keeping it low. Uh, but more people need to know about this because there's a lot of money on the table. There is no deadline for this, um, so, but still, uh, we have 400 plus thousand families have not applied for reimbursement yet. Just amazing. So if, if I had a loved one who passed away early on in, you know, April of last year, I can, I can still apply retroactively, correct? That's right. Okay. You have to call the funeral home and get a, a copy of the receipt and, you know, put a few things together, but it's any death since January 20th of 2020 okay. and forward, going forward. It, it, uh, it, every funeral, the government aims to pay for. Um, this, this is great, great, great that you're sharing this with. with it's them. important to get the word out on this and I wanna accent, beware of scammers that you see there. This is something, picture this. Anyone can look at a funeral home website and funeral home websites, as you know, they put all the, services that take place there. And they'll put it for like a year back, you can see, and you can then link to the, to the uh, obituary. Then you can see they died of COVID. And you, that scammer could call the funeral home and say, hey, I'm a member of the Smith family. Can you send me a copy of it? And unbeknownst, uh, they would. And then, then of course, that person could call the family saying, hey, I'm with FEMA. We've got the information. We just need a little bit more information. Can you give us the social security number? Can you give us this other information? Um, look, we've all read about burglaries that take place during funerals because everybody knows people are at the funeral home. This is the same heartless, cold-blooded behavior that we all need to be aware of. Um, be very careful. No one mm -hmm. from FEMA is calling you and no person can help you get FEMA reimbursement. Simply okay. call that 844 number and okay. get started. No, this is, and I added the link to the website in there, but our discussion last Friday was on scams. And uh, that's exactly is, is that if you pick up the phone and somebody is trying to sell you something, you can 
hang up, ask for their phone number and hang up the phone and call them back after you've done a little bit of research and um, found out all of your options. But for those of us on this call today, uh, it's very important. FEMA is not just going to call you. Nobody's going to call you, actually, unless they were looking at the obituary and they're not the one administering this program. So um, this is great. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joel Broida has a question. I'm going to bring him on here. Joel, if you want to open up your mic and uh, ask your question. Hey, Joel. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm Joel Broida. I live in Columbia, Maryland, and I'm on a committee for congregation, and we are putting together an end-of-life planning set of options. I'm calling it a work in progress. And we've been utilizing it in the last couple of months and it keeps on growing. One of the difficulties that we're having in developing it is that the funeral homes, as you stated early in your presentation, are refusing to tell what they will charge. Now, let me go a little further. There is one organization in Washington called the Jewish Funeral Practices Committee of Greater Washington. And they have contracted with a funeral home in the Washington metropolitan area, and they will have a fixed price. But it, it's not only the funeral uh, that we're dealing with. We're dealing with hospice. We're including in our guide. We're dealing with cemetery plots. We are dealing with services in the home in the next day or two afterwards. And so it's a complete way of helping people plan ahead. And last week, the last two weeks, we've had three that we've been involved in. And one, uh, we just sort of got the information to them in time. Uh, people want help. People want to know what they're getting into, and people would like to plan ahead. I bought my cemetery plots in 1993, four of them, two doubles, top, bottom, and they're there. I have a deed. Those have gone up about four to five times that plot that I have since that time. People would like to pre-plan and be guaranteed that it'll be there when they get there. So I guess my question to you is, what do we do about those funeral homes that we want to get them in a room and put up their price list? They refuse to come. Now with COVID, we can't even get the room, uh, but they won't even do it on Zoom. They're uh, not willing and that is difficult. People need to know. Yeah. Well, Joel, uh, one good thing is uh, we've introduced you to Ed Michael Reggie, who might be able to help you with some uh, costs for some of the, uh, the, the funeral homes in your region. Okay. Uh, but you, br you brought up a bunch of good uh, talking points there. Yes, I use us as a resource, Joel, but let me um, acquaint you with the 1984 FTC funeral rule, you can Google it, FTC funeral rule. It mandates that every funeral home in America must give you its general price list if you call them or appear there in person. That's the secret to how we got all of these prices. And the good thing about the general price list is defined by the federal government so that you can compare line item by line item, funeral home against funeral home. So you can do apples to apples to apples comparisons. So you just need to invoke, say, you know, according to the FTC, you need to give me your, your general price list. Now, if the questions are beyond the price list, like how much would it cost to have an event? As we know, that's a tailored event where you may want more of line two or some of line three or not line four or whatever, that may be different, but you should be able to get all of the price lists of every funeral home in your area. That's great. Thank you. And I have another person on my committee who's going to, couldn't watch now, but who, who will watch the transcript. Okay, and send me an email, please. And, I'm, yeah. I'm and we'll get yeah. in touch with you. 
Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay, thanks a lot, Joel. Okay, and uh, boy, we got a pile of questions here, so let's try to get through them, Ed Michael. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, okay. If you decide to do a home funeral, do you need? Okay, we already talked about that. Uh, so, Bob, you hopefully you heard uh, some of the resources we talked about having a home funeral, and um, uh, you need again. The main thing you need is a death certificate, and then. Uh, anything else for somebody doing a home funeral, uh, Ed? I just would uh, look at local regulations about where the burial will take place and making sure you, as we know, you can't spread ashes over every bottle of body of water. Um, you know, many lakes, many bottles of water prohibits it. So you just need to look at what local regulations are about the whole event and what you plan on doing, where to bury. But certainly the event itself can be at home. Okay. And then Kenneth, on that topic, he says, creme creme cremation frequently come from the funeral home in a plastic bag inside a black plastic box. Do most families deposit the black plastic box in the ground with no vault, or do they remove the plastic bag from the black box, pierce the plastic, and cover the plastic bag with earth? Uh, any sort of uh, thoughts you can share on how, how families generally deal with the uh, cre cremation? I would vote for the greenest method of doing that. And depending on how biodegradable the urn itself is, I, a plastic bag doesn't sound very good. Mm -hmm. um, but I would look to um, combine the remains with the earth in the easiest way possible. But that's just my personal recommendation. Got it. Um, let's see, Bridget Avery asks, will FEMA reimburse families who have already buried their loved ones who have died from COVID? And the answer to that is yes. Yes. Okay. And then uh, up to a total of three people, um, up to a total of three people, three funeral costs may be reimbursed, possibly $30,000 or more. I'm not sure what they're... Um, I think they're referring to the fact that there's a limit to the number of reimbursements a family can get. Ah, okay, got it. It's one of those audit procedures where they just want to make sure that someone doesn't apply for 35. Um, but there's a three or four limit. Okay, got it. Um, when the phone lines opened the first days of the program, more than a million people called and the phone lines shut down. The FEMA call center had to hire many more people. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, as Ed Michael has uh, shared, our hopes is, is that everybody who's calling this program is legitimate. But with every government program, there's just so many people working the system and scammers and things of that nature. Um, let's see, somebody says, an attorney read and looked at the specific details of the funeral reimbursement plan. And the, the attorney interpreted and said the FEMA funeral program will reimburse for COVID related deaths, even if the life insurance policy paid for the funeral. Can you comment on this? And are you familiar with this part of the, okay, so somebody might have a life insurance that paid for the funeral. Okay, yeah. It's a very good question. And um, the, the latest uh, is that if a, pre-planned event took, uh, that if you funded this funeral early, it is not reimbursable. Um, I don't know if the government is considering reversing that position, but they're saying a, a funeral that was paid for before January 20th or whatever, uh, that was planned um, is not included in this. Um, makes sense to me that if you're gonna do this, you should reimburse everybody, but I, that gets very complicated because you're then reimbursing an insurance company um, un unless you're talking about reversing the premiums that were paid and paying them directly. I guess the, the government opted for simplicity here, mm -hmm. but it'll be interesting to see what happens because I know that, that a lot of parties are contesting this and wanting it to change. Okay, no, that's good to know. And um, okay, and then uh, I dropped a link into the, um, oh, they're, they're clarifying here, not the funeral prepaid, but paid for by a life insurance policy. So my gut level feeling is 
a life insurance policy is uh, is funding the, the money from a life insurance policy can be used to spend on a variety of things. It's not specific. Whereas okay. the pre-planning funeral is specific. So I think if somebody has a life insurance policy and they use some of that, that um, disbursement to pay for a funeral, they could just show the receipts of the funeral expenses and use the FEMA program. I think the prepaid insurance policy is probably something that's not being reimbursed. You're exactly right. It's That's a difference because yes, if you use proceeds of a life insurance policy, a credit card, um, any other forms of payment, that's all reimbursable. Yes, a pre-need insurance policy is technically life insurance, but it's, um, it's a different animal and it's excluded from this. But a regular life insurance policy that is, as you say, Steve, uh, you can spend it on virtually anything, those proceeds, that is reimbursable. Great. And then what, the, our last question, and, and as I look at the clock, it's almost one, is um, uh, could you explain that 1984 funeral law again? And to help with that, I also, I dropped that into um, chat, a link to the FTC funeral law, but, but tell us a little bit again, uh, what the, what the gist of that law is? Yeah, very quickly. Time Magazine always lists its you know if if Time Magazine still exists today. Time Magazine lists the hundred most important nonfiction books of all time. One of them is Jessica Mitford's book from 1963 called The American Way of Dying, which was Jessica Mitford's indictment of the funeral industry as a bunch of scammers that they've invented this thing called funeral service that they've made it into this expensive event. And she is an advocate, was an advocate of the home funeral and getting out of this foolishness that you have to pay a funeral director and all of that it was very revolutionary. And it had great ramifications across America. And it took years, but finally the um, consumer advocates uh, pled their case and the, and the federal government created the FTC funeral rule. And the funeral rule is a way is, is an attempt to make pricing more apparent and more easily accessible to people. And the funeral rule says, first of all, we're gonna define what a funeral home's price list is so that if it's, um, uh, if it's embalming, it's embalming. You can't say, we do a different type of embalming. No, all embalming is the line item, you know, and you've just gotta put your price for what, what that is. So the, the, the federal government made sure that all general price lists are, are similar. It then mandates that all any consumer who makes a phone call and asks can get that information or calls in person. Of course, where's online? Online is not there. So the FTC has been um, asking that question within itself. It's at hearings. Uh, you know, what are we going to do? Can we can we mandate that these prices be online? It's an interesting question. Uh, should we should it be mandated? I honestly don't know of any industry who's mandated to put their prices online. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we did it, but you know, that's us voluntarily. Um, but you know, there's certainly a good cause. Not every funeral home has a website. So would it require that, you know, that they have to get a website? I'm not sure, but the funeral rule is, uh, uh, has a few other important aspects, but the number one thing that we all should know is that you can get their price list. Yeah, and that's, that's real percent. important. As, as Joel has discovered, it's not as easy, e easier said than done, but if you drop the fact that, hey, I heard the FTC has this rule, 1984, you're supposed to give this to me, uh, that might help. Um, let's see, I, I, I see that Gloria has her hand raised. Gloria, if that's not a mistake and you uh, had a question, I've, I've asked you to be unmuted. And while we're waiting to see if you, Hop on there, Ed. If you've got any sort of closing thoughts, uh, th this is great. I've shared your your contact information in the chat, but this has been a great discussion. I just want to reach out to everyone on 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 this uh, conference here and say, if if I can be of any assistance, please call me. I believe in the consumer advocacy that we are putting forth here, and I, um, I'm not fighting the industry at all. I believe that there are quality people in funeral service, uh, but we need to have the prices and look at ratings and 
and have the full, excuse me, shopping experience that consumers can have from the privacy of their own home and look and see and figure all this out better than at the last minute when dad just died. Uh, there's a better way to do this. Yeah. Oh, and let's see, Bob asks, uh, I don't, uh, Ed, do you have a, a phone number where somebody could reach you? Um, yes. I'm looking on your, your website here, but if you- um, My signature block, but it's 212-937-4744. 212-937-4744. That's my uh, phone number. And my email is emreggie at funeralocity.com. Okay, um, great. Uh, I'm sharing that there. Uh, this is fantastic, uh, Ed Michael. Um, and uh, I think we should maybe do this, you know, every so often because there's uh, we just got to get the word out. And I love having somebody like you who's sort of put together a consolidated list and is promoting choice for the, the consumer. And this is actually helping the funeral homes because a lot of these folks, they don't even know where they're at, you know, so, um, so this is amazing. So it's my pleasure and I look forward to doing this again and uh, let's let's advance it and take up, you know, other topics that people are interested in, but it's been I love great. It. All right. Well, thanks a lot. And again, thanks to the audience for such great questions today. We will be talking to everybody soon.